of election year partisanship. We can't, America can't afford it. Madam President, uh, thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I yield the floor. Senator from Oregon. Madam President, I, I thank my colleague from Colorado for his remarks about the production tax credit. This is incredibly important to the, the, the wind industry, uh, which is a big factor in the economy of Colorado and, and certainly a substantial factor in the economy of Oregon. So I, I join in, in his making his case, if you will, that we need to make sure that we continue to drive forward this clean energy manufacturing economy that produces zero carbon dioxide. And I can tell you I recently had the chance to drive from the northern border of Oregon to the southern border in an electric leaf. And we have enough charging stations now along the interstate to make this, this possible. And it was, uh, felt something miraculous to not produce a single molecule of pollution out of that car trip. And if that energy for that car is coming from wind, then not as uh, any zero carbon dioxide is produced, zero impact on, on global warming. And so certainly what is very good for the American worker, for the American economy, is also good for our air and the environment here in our nation and around the world. So we must get this production tax credit uh, passed, and I'll continue to work with him to make this happen. Thank you. Madam President, I, I rise today to address a critical issue for Oregon's ranchers and farmers who are dealing with wildfire devastation, huge devastation. I'm going to put up some pictures. Let's put up all four charts. We've had in, in the last month the largest fires in Oregon in over a century. An enormous amount of land has been burned in the, in the process. Uh, the Long Draw Fire in Malheur County burned 557,000 acres. Or to translate that, that's about 900 square miles. This is the largest wildfire in Oregon since the 1800s. This chart shows the incredibly powerful flames that these ranchers and farmers have been dealing with as these flames sweep across the grasslands. The cattle and other livestock are often uh, killed in the process and um, the land does not quickly recover because of the intensity of the fire and how it affects the, the soil. And let me give you another view of this same fire. This is actually a picture taken from Nevada looking towards Oregon. And you see this massive wall, this massive wall of smoke coming across. Uh, it is um, an incredible sight to behold when a fire is in full rage as this was. Now the Long Draw Fire was one of the, the major fires, but the Miller Homestead Fire was another. It burned about 250 square miles. Here again you can see the dramatic flame front that Southeast Oregon was fighting. So this is moving through the sagebrush, just continuously progressing, uh, moving very, very quickly when the wind is driving it, create an enormous wall of, of, of smoke. And uh, let's take one more view. Here we see the aftermath of the fire when it was stopped by a road as an interlude and the completely destroyed land on one side of the highway and what it looked like, this green grassland. So this was not all dry and parched, this green grassland uh, before the fire moved through. In addition to these two huge fires, we've had a number of others. The Lex Fall fire in Jefferson County, the Baker Canyon fire in Jefferson and Wasco counties, the West Crater fire in Malheur County, uh, each of these having a substantial impact in addition to the Miller Homestead and the Long Draw fires. Together, these fires have consumed over 1,100 square miles. That's roughly 
an area the size of Rhode Island. So an entire state would fit into the area burned in Oregon. These fires are now under control and southeastern Oregon is surveying the damage and picking up the pieces. And one of the things that they would immediately turn to, our farmers and our ranchers, would be the disaster assistance that has always existed within the Farm Bill. But guess what? These disaster assistance programs are not available because the House has failed to act on the Farm Bill. The Senate passed the Farm Bill, a bipartisan bill, Republicans and Democrats coming together, and in it are the reauthorization of four key programs. One of them is the Livestock Indemnity Program that addresses, when there's a natural disaster like this, addresses the death and the loss of cattle and other livestock. A second is the Emergency Assistance for Livestock called ELAP program that basically addresses the lost value of forage on private land. And then the LFP program or Livestock Forage Disaster Program that addresses the loss of forage on public land. Because those of you who are not from the West may not be aware that a lot of our livestock are operating on land that is leased to our, our ranchers. And so when a fire like this affects those public lands, it's also affecting the value of the lease to those farmers and the ability of their, their livestock, those that have survived the fire, to be able to find forage and continue uh, to live. So it is deeply disturbing, deeply disturbing, that the House has not voted on a farm bill and sent it to conference. And I urge them to act on this quickly. Without these key disaster relief programs, ranchers and farmers who have lost livestock or grazing land are left with few options, and that is wrong. A rancher in southeastern Oregon who has already been devastated with wildfire shouldn't pay the price because the U.S. House of Representatives won't bring a farm bill that it can pass and send to conference. So let's be clear. The best solution to this problem, as well as many other issues, would be for the House to pass the bipartisan Senate Farm Bill. This would bring timely relief to all those who have suffered in this disaster, and certainly to the farmers and ranchers across Oregon who have been struck by the largest fire in this century, a fire larger than the state of Rhode Island. But if we can get consensus to bring immediate relief in the face of the inaction by the House, then we should do so. And that is why I've introduced the Wildfire and Drought Relief for Ranchers and Farmers Act to extend the most urgently needed programs immediately. This would extend the program for livestock indemnity. This would extend the program for forage loss on public lands and forage loss on private lands. I urge my colleagues to take the same bipartisan spirit that they brought to the Farm Bill to recognize that this chamber has already voted to extend these disaster programs and, if necessary, move quickly to extend these disaster programs, if necessary by themselves, in order to help our ranchers, to help our farmers who have been affected by these natural disasters, including this once-in-a-century fire in the state of Oregon. So again, I, I encourage the House of Representatives to immediately get the Farm Bill to conference, because this should be done in the context of many, many programs that need to be renewed and that have been worked out. But in the absence of that, let's find a way to move quickly to assist our farmers and ranchers in the face of devastating national disaster. Thank you, Madam President, and I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Minnesota. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business for the duration of my remarks. Without objection. Madam President, I rise today to speak on the five-year anniversary of the horrific collapse of the I-35W bridge in Minneapolis and to pay tribute 
to those who lost their lives on that tragic summer day. As I said the day after the bridge collapsed, a bridge just shouldn't fall down in the middle of America. Not a bridge that's a few blocks from my house, not an eight lane highway, not a bridge that I drive over every day with my husband and my daughter. But that's what happened that sunny summer day in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I can't even begin to count how many times I have thought about that bridge and everyone in our state actually remembers where they were the day that it collapsed. It was one of the most heavily traveled bridges in our state and in all that day 13 people lost their lives and scores were injured. So many more could have been killed if not for the first responders, if not for the volunteers who instead of running away from that disaster when they actually had no idea what had actually happened, they ran toward it and rescued their fellow citizens. Everyone was shocked and horrified. But on that evening and in the days that followed, the whole world watched as our state came together, as they did in the minutes and the hours after the collapse. I was proud to be a Minnesotan. The emergency response to the bridge collapse demonstrated an impressive level of preparedness and coordination that should be a model for the nation. We saw true heroes in the face of unimaginable circumstances. We saw an off-duty Minneapolis firefighter named Shanna Hansen who grabbed her life jacket and was among the first at the scene. Tethered to a yellow life rope in the midst of broken concrete and tangled rebar, she swam from car to car searching for survivors up and down in that river. We saw that school bus perch precariously on the fallen bridge deck. I called it the miracle bus. Inside there were dozens of kids from a very poor neighborhood who had been on a swimming field trip. Their bus was crossing the bridge when it dropped. Thanks to the quick action of responsible adults and the children themselves, they all survived. They all got off that bus. Although you can never feel good about a tragedy like this one, I certainly felt good about our police officers, our firefighters, our paramedics, and all the medical personnel that literally saved dozens and dozens of lives. On this, the five-year anniversary of the bridge collapse, we should again honor those heroes and the countless lives that they saved. And I just want to, for a minute, um, Madam President, tell you a few examples. A woman named Pamela Waji, who wrote for the rights for the Star Tribune, gathered some of their stories this weekend. Some of these people I know. Uh, Lindsay Patterson Walls, uh, she was in her Volkswagen, went over the bridge, kicked out the doors and the windows and was able to get out and survive. Uh, she is putting the collapse to work in her career. She's a youth worker who counsels children and teens and she discovered that her trauma, as hard as it was, wasn't so different than that of her clients. She felt insecure in the world, wondering whether another bridge would collapse under her. And she realized that the homeless teens that she counseled feel insecure, wondering where they would sleep at night. And it's a lesson she takes with her every day in her job. Betsy Sather, someone that I've come to know, her husband was 29 years old when he died in that bridge collapse. They had just gotten married. They planned on having a family. You know what she did? She decided to adopt children. She decided to adopt children from Haiti. And in the aftermath of that earthquake, she had already had in and knew the names of these children she was going to adopt. She wouldn't let those kids just be left in that rubble. She contacted our office. We worked with her and brought Elise and Ross back from Haiti. And she is their mother. And I just saw them this weekend with their big smiles and their mom. That's an inspirational story. The Coulter family, they were in their minivan. The kids, the mom, the dad. Uh, it was clear at the beginning uh, that they were severely injured and the mom, Paula, they didn't think she was going to survive. They also then, after they learned that maybe she was going to make it, she had devastating injuries to her brain and her back. Uh, one time during one of the surgeries, they had to jolt her heart back to life. Uh, they actually suggested her family start looking for nursing home care, but she didn't give up. Paula didn't give up, her family didn't get up. And after two years, with the help of some great therapists, she could walk and move again, go back to her accounting job part-time. And two summers ago, she and her trainer ran a 5K race. That's inspirational. 
But then there's the bridge itself. After it collapsed, it was so clear to us that we had to rebuild it, and we had to rebuild it right away. In just three days, Senator Coleman and I worked together in the Senate to secure $250 million in emergency bridge reconstruction funding. Representative Jim Oberstar led the way in the House. Approval of the funding came with remarkable speed in this chamber. It was bipartisan, and we were able to get the funding. And from the moment that bridge started construction to the end, it took less than a year to rebuild a bridge that is now a 10-lane highway. Today, the new I-35W bridge is a symbol of pride and the resilience of a community. Just this weekend, when I was out at Twin Cities Heroes Parade with our veterans, the organizer looked at me proudly and said, tonight they're lighting up the 35W bridge, red, white, and blue. So it literally has become a symbol of hope in our state. The new bridge is a 100-year bridge with more lanes, as I mentioned, than before. It's also safer. The bridge includes state-of-the-art anti-acing technology, as well as shoulders, which the old bridge didn't have. Of course, bridge safety was on the minds of all Americans, especially those of us in Minnesota following the bridge collapse. Immediately afterwards, the Minnesota Department of Transportation inspected all 25 bridges in Minnesota with a similar design as the I-35W bridge. The inspection led to the closing of Highway 23 bridge in St. Cloud, where bulging of gusset plates was found. I remember seeing it myself. And it accelerated the planned replacement of that bridge, which opened in 2009. But the reforms were not all structural. Since then, the Department of Transportation in our state has improved the way the inspections and maintenance functions of the department handle critical information and necessary repairs. Just like in Minnesota, bridge safety became a priority nationally as well. After the National Transportation Safety Board identified gusset plates as being heavily responsible for the collapse, a critical review of gusset plates was conducted on bridges across America, and there was new attention focused on deterioration of steel and weight added to bridges over the years through maintenance and resurfacing projects. And the national organization that develops highway and bridge standards, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, updated bridge manuals that are used by state and county bridge engineers across the nation. Now, I will say, Madam President, that five years later, we have still not made as much progress as I would have liked. The Federal Highway Administration estimates that over 25% of the nation's 600,000 bridges are still either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. And the American Society of Civil Engineers gave Bridges in America a C grade in its 2009 report card for America's infrastructure and a D for infrastructure overall. We did take a positive step forward with the recent bipartisan transportation bill that will help state departments of transportation fix bridges and improve infrastructure. For Minnesota, that bill means more than $700 million for Minnesota's roads, bridges, transit, congestion mitigation projects, and mobility improvements. The bill gives greater flexibility to state departments of transportation to direct federal resources to address unique needs in each state. It also establishes benchmarks and national policy goals, including strengthening our nation's bridges and links those to federal funds. It reduces project delivery time and accelerates processes that will reduce in half the amount of time to get projects underway. However, we all know that more needs to be done. While other countries are moving full steam ahead with infrastructure investments, we seem to be simply treading water. And in an increasing competitive global economy, standing still is falling behind. China and India are spending respectively nine and 5% of their GDPs on infrastructure. We need to keep up. We need to build our infrastructure. That's why I authored the Rebuild America Jobs Act last fall, which would have invested in our nation's infrastructure. It also would have created a national infrastructure bank, something that you're very familiar with, Madam President, to help facilitate public-private partnerships so that projects could be built that would otherwise be too expensive for city, county, or even a state to accomplish on its own. And we included a provision to set aside a certain amount of funding for rural projects. Unfortunately, while we got a majority of the Senate voting to advance this bill, we were unable to break the filibuster. So five years to the day after the 35W bridge fell into the Mississippi River, 
we know we have much to do to ensure our 21st century economy has the 21st century infrastructure that we need. I know that I am committed to move forward and working in a bipartisan way to address our nation's critical bridge and infrastructure needs and prevent another tragedy like the collapse of the I-35W bridge. They didn't distinguish on that bridge today, who was on that day five years ago, who was a Democrat or Republican, and certainly those first responders that showed up, the cops and firefighters, they didn't ask what political party someone belonged to. They simply did their job. That's what we need to do in the United States Senate. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Connecticut. I thank the chair. Madam President, uh, I rise to speak about the uh, uh, Cybersecurity Act of 2012, which is uh, uh, titled uh, or numbered S3414. Um, last night, uh, the Majority Leader, Senator Reid, uh, filed a cloture petition, uh, which would ripen for a vote uh, tomorrow. Uh, Senator Reid said that uh, he was saddened uh, to have to file a cloture petition. He used the word, <laughs> which we don't hear used around here anymore, but it seemed just right. He was flummoxed by the uh, uh, need to uh, file a, a cloture petition on bipartisan legislation that responds to uh, what all of the uh, experts in security in our country from the last administration and this one say is a critical threat to our security, which is the lack of defenses uh, in, in the uh, 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 cyber infrastructure that is owned by the private sector. And um, Senator Reid was saddened as I was that he had to file for cloture because of course there can be disagreements about how to respond uh, to this threat to our security and our prosperity because hundreds of billions of dollars of American ingenuity, American money have already been stolen by uh, cyber thieves operating uh, not only from within our country but more often from outside. But uh, So you can have differences of opinion about how to uh, deal with the problem but the fact that people started to introduce totally irrelevant amendments uh, such as the one to repeal Obamacare. Well, you know, that's a debatable issue. Uh, we've debated it many times, certainly the House has, but not on this bill. Uh, not on this bill, which we urgently need to pass and send to the House to go in a conference and then, um, uh, then hopefully pass something this year and send it to the President. Uh, Madam President, I was at a briefing with a, uh, more than a dozen members of the Senate representing a wide uh, bipartisan group and uh, ideological group with, with leaders of our uh, security agencies, cybersecurity agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, NSA, <clears throat> National Security Agency. And um, they, they could not have been clear about the fact that this, is, this cyber threat is not just a speculative threat. The fact is we're under attack over cyberspace right now. And um, what, what's been, in terms of economic theft, as I said, we've already lost an enormous amount of money. General Alexander, Keith Alexander, Chief of the U.S. Cyber Command, uh, described the loss of industrial information and intellectual property and just plain money through cyber uh, theft as, quote, the greatest transfer of wealth in in history, that's going on. We're also under cyber attack by enemies that are probing uh, the control systems, the cyber control systems that control not, not the mom and pop businesses at home, not the, 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 the internet uh, systems over which so many of us shop these days, but the, the cyber systems that control the electric supply, that control all of our financial transactions, large and small, that control our transportation system, our telecommunication system, all the things that we depend on uh, to sustain our society and our individual lives. I mean, uh, so, okay, uh, that, that's who, who we're talking about here. 
the greatest transfer of wealth in history. But our enemies are already probing those private companies, cyber systems that control that kind of critical infrastructure I've just described. There's some reason to believe that they may already, because of the vulnerability of those systems and lack of adequate defenses, placed in them malware, bugs, whatever we want to call a kind of, in the old days we used to call it like a sleeper cell of spies, or more recently in terms of terrorism, a sleeper cell of terrorists. Um, I worry, let me put it personally, without stating it definitively on the floor, that I worry that enemies of the United States have already faced, placed what I'd call cyber sleeper cells in critical cyber control systems that control critical infrastructure in our country. And everybody will tell you that um, some companies that own critical infrastructure are doing a pretty good job at defending it and us, but some are not. That's, why, that's one of the reasons this bill has occurred, uh, to, to try to create a collaborative process where the private sector and the public sector could act together in the national interest. It, the, the businesses themselves are going to be, God forbid, there's a major cyber attack on the U.S. The businesses that control cyber infrastructure are going to be uh, enormous losers. They're going to be subject under the current state of the law to the kind of liability in court that may bring some of them down, and may end their uh, corporate uh, existence. Would a senator yield for a question? I would be glad to yield to my friend from Delaware for a from question, Delaware. a co-sponsor of the main bill, 3414. Uh, well, the message that you're conveying today is so important. I hope folks that are uh, unsure about whether or not support uh, our legislation that you've led us on, uh, I hope they're listening. Uh, I was briefed uh, earlier today by large uh, multinational company. Uh, one of the divisions uh, manufactures, among other things, helicopters. And apparently, uh, uh, within the last 12 months, maybe in the last six months, uh, the uh, plans uh, for developing and manufacturing one such helicopter was, uh, was hacked uh, and obtained uh, by uh, another nation, presumably the Chinese. Uh, they will develop, they will build their version of our helicopters. They won't be built by Americans. They will not provide American jobs. They will not provide revenues to that company or tax revenues to, to our treasury. Uh, they'll be uh, really apprehended, if you will, by another nation. And that is uh, the reality of this day. You know, I was reminded again just, uh, just uh, this morning that given what you're talking about, the, uh, what General Alexander says is the largest theft in, uh, economic theft in the history of our country, it is taking place. And I was reminded of it just this morning. I just wanted to share that. Um, I thank my friend uh, from Delaware very much, and, and I think you crystallized the moment we're at. As I was saying, Senator Reid filed a cloture petition. It will ripen tomorrow. So this, this immediately, again, he did it in sadness. I was sad that he had to do it. This is the kind of issue in which I'd hope we'd overcome um, uh, kind of gridlock, special interest driven, ideologically driven, politically driven, but uh, we, we couldn't do it. So the, the majority leader did exactly what he had to do, in my opinion, in the national security interest. And this does two things. One, uh, as my colleagues know, and I repeat just to remind them, uh, we have a 1 p.m. deadline that any member of the Senate can file a first degree amendment to this bill. Uh, th that's important to do. And uh, I want to say that um, the managers of the bill, Senator Collins' staff, the Republican cloakroom, my staff, the Democratic cloakroom, are, are going to be working on these amendments to see if we can begin to move toward a finite list so that we can uh, give some sense of certainty. Uh, Senator Reid has been very clear. He has not wanted to, to use the idiom of the Senate, fill the tree, which is to say limit amendments. He's wanted to have an open amendment process, which really ought to happen in a bill of this kind, but, but open for germane and relevant amendments, not amendments on repealing Obamacare, or I say respectfully, on, on uh, enacting more gun control. Those are both significant, substantial issues, but they're going to block this bill from passing if, if people insist on bringing them up here. So first consequence, of, uh, and a positive consequence, of uh, Senator Reid's uh, cloture petition, or the one we all signed, is to, um, uh, is to uh, require that the amendments that people have been talking about come forward by 1 p.m. Bipartisan staffs will be working to try to winnow that down to a finite list. Secondly, um, 
if we don't have an agreement on a finite list and we can't vitiate the uh, cloture vote for tomorrow, then the members of the Senate, everyone in their own heart and head, is going to have to make a decision. Um, am I actually going to vote against taking this bill up uh, while all the non-political uh, experts on, on our security, General Keith Alexander, Director of Cyber Command within the Pentagon, head of the National Security Agency, one of the jewels and treasures of our government protecting our security, appealed to Senator Reid and Senator McConnell in a letter yesterday uh, uh, that this the legislation is critically necessary now. He, he, he was uh, just said, this legislation will give our government and the private sector operators of critical cyber infrastructure powers that they don't have now, authorities that they don't have now to collaborate, uh, to take action, to share information, uh, to adopt what uh, General Alexander in a wonderful phrase says, the, the best computer hygiene, the best cyber hygiene uh, to protect uh, our country. And uh, I don't know how people, well, let me just say, that that's the question. Members of the Senate will have to decide in the face of that kind of statement of the urgency of some form of cybersecurity legislation in this session from the director of Cyber Command, an honored, uh, distinguished uh, uh, veteran of our uh, uniform military, U.S. Army in this case, will people really vote? Are we going to find it hard to get 60 members of the Senate to vote, to at least take this bill up and debate it? Um, I hope not. I think people are, it's going to be, for me, it would be hard to explain, I'll put it that way, why I would vote against it, no matter what, uh, what the controversy is. And, and I just say, my, my friend from Delaware has been involved, and I'm going to yield to him if you'd like to make a statement. We've been working really hard, three groups. The group that sponsored S3414, the Cybersecurity Act of 2012. Um, the group that sponsored Secure IT, Senators uh, Hutchison, Chambliss, McCain, et, et al. And um, the third group, bipartisan group, that sprung up because of the urgency of this danger, this clear and present danger to America, led by Senator uh, Kyle and Senator Whitehouse is on the floor, and really play, has played an important role in, in bringing the two sides, if I can put it that way, closer together. Frankly, there was a chasm <laughs> that separated us at the outset of this. We, we've changed our bill. It's, uh, we've made it much more voluntary, carrots instead of sticks, as I, you and I uh, have said. And, um, but still, there's, there are differences. And I, I just say shame on us if we can't bridge those differences on national security uh, of all topics. So um, these are, this is an important day to see if we can come together. Uh, I, I'm, Senator Collins and I are ready and willing to meet with the, the sponsors of the other bills, with Senator Kyle, Senator Whitehouse, to see if we can uh, come to some kind of agreement on, on critical parts of this legislation and to come up with a finite list that we can agree that we will support. Just a final word. I want to thank the Majority Leader, Senator Reid. Uh, Senator Reid has a tough job, and uh, it's obviously battered by the political uh, moment uh, that we're in whenever we're in it. And of course, this is a particularly political moment, partisan, because of, um, because of the election season, campaign we're in. But I, I, I know Harry Reid for quite a while. I, I, I have the greatest confidence and trust in him and uh, an awful lot of affection. He's a personal friend. Um, he got briefed about the threat, the cybersecurity threat, more than a year ago. And uh, he called me in and we talked about it, and he said he was really worried that we had to do something in this session of Congress to protect our security. And he has been steadfast in that belief. Uh, and he's refused to, to give up. He filed the cloture petition uh, to bring this to a head and hopefully to get to that finite list of amendments. And I think he's going to stretch within the process and time, great authority, power that the majority leader has. Some people <laughs> say it may be the only power these days, but I think he has more because of his skills. Uh, controlling the schedule. Uh, I think if there's a hope <laughs> that we can bring a bill together and pass a cybersecurity bill, I think Senator Reid's going to give us every opportunity to do that. 
And uh, so I wanted to just put on the record my thanks to him for uh, his own commitment to improving the cybersecurity of our country because he's listened to the experts and they've convinced them this is rising to be a greater threat to America than any other threat we face uh, today. And that's, that's saying a lot, but uh, I, I believe it. Uh, I thank the chair and I yield the floor to my friend. I, I thank you very, very much. I, uh, we've been joined on the floor by uh, Senator Whitehouse. Senator from uh, Delaware. Uh, uh, thank you. I've been joined on the floor by Senator Whitehouse, and, and uh, we might just take a moment here, Mr. Chairman, just to have a, uh, a little bit of a colloquy, and, and then uh, uh, I'm going to head off to one of my hearings. But I, uh, I just want to say while he's here, uh, special thanks to Senator Whitehouse for the work that he and uh, John Kyle, a colleague from Arizona, uh, Chris Coons, our colleague from, uh, from Delaware, and others have, have done and really helped to, to uh, put the, uh, the meat on the bones of our if you will, of our uh, original legislation. And you've done uh, great work, and I, I just uh, really admire it and, and want to thank all of you. Um, over at the other end of the Capitol, uh, they spent a whole lot of time in, in recent weeks and months uh, on the issue of fast and furious. And uh, I, I just want to mention, I think the American people, are, one of the reasons why they're furious with us is because we're not going fast enough to deal with the economy, to create jobs. And uh, in, in government, we don't create jobs. Uh, presidents don't create jobs. Governors don't create jobs. As an old governor, I know this. Uh, members of the Senate don't create Mayors don't create jobs. What we do is help create a nurturing environment for job creation and job preservation. That's what we do. And that includes a, a lot of things. It includes uh, world-class workforce, world-class infrastructure, access to capital, reasonably uh, priced accessible energy, reasonably priced health care. And it also includes as we go forward in time, uh, the assurance that if a, a company spends a lot of money, a lot of R&D in, investments, and they come up with a really good idea that has commercial application, and before that they can even build that idea, create that idea, sell that idea in this country and manufacture and sell it around the world, the idea is going to be stolen. Stolen. By someone from another country who will use that idea to make money on their own. That uh, introduces a, an uncertainty to this economy in this country that we never had to worry about before. We just not had, had, had to worry about before. And, uh, you know, General Alexander has, has said and been quoted here already today that the greatest uh, economic thievery in our history is un underway right now through cybersecurity. This is as much a job issue as it is a, a security issue, it's an economic security issue. We have to be mindful to, 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 to of that. I, uh, I've, I've spoken to some of our friends out at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce with whom we work on a variety of issues. Uh, we need their, their involvement, we need their support, we need them to help us to get to yes. And if they have uh, ideas, good ideas, uh, have, have, they've read the legislation as re, redrawn and will share those ideas with us today, Democrats and Republicans, that would be a huge help. And anybody over at the chamber is watching today, and I hope they are, uh, this is a request for you to, to, uh, to just to be more involved in a constructive way. It's not that we just need you in the Senate. We, we need you as a country. And the folks that are your members across the country, they need you to be involved as, as, as well. Uh, legislation that started out as more of a command and control deal where Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security is going to say, these are our standards. We expect companies and industries and uh, critical uh, areas where we expect you to comply with those, and that's it. And that's an oversimplification of the original approach in our, our legislation, but we've moved so far from that, it's, uh, it's um, amazing. And what we've moved from is from a command and control system to, to one where we say to, to critical industries, you know, sensitive industries, you figure out amongst yourselves what the best practices and what the standards ought to be for protecting you and your businesses and your ideas. You figure it out. You share those ideas, develop those ideas really in a collaborative way with a council that includes Department of Commerce, Department of Justice, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and in an iterative process, refine those ideas, refine those best practices, refine those standards, which would then uh, be uh, implemented. If companies didn't want to comply with them, they don't have to. It's a voluntary basis. If they do, there's rewards. If they don't, they don't participate in those rewards, including uh, protection from, from liability. I mean, this is a, you know, we, sometimes we get stuck on legislation and we just say, this is it, we're not going to change it. This is it. 
and nobody you can try to amend it. You, we're not going to let you do that. We've changed this legislation dramatically, and I think for the best. Some people would say we changed it too much in order to try to get to, to yes. And the last thing I say before I, I yield to maybe to Senator uh, Whitehouse is, is, is uh, the, the legislation before us, this is not a Democratic idea. This is not a Republican idea. This is not a conservative idea. This is not a liberal idea. This is a good idea. And this is an idea that's gotten better over time. This is an idea whose time has come. And we, uh, we need to be mindful of the fury across our country, and we need to move faster to take uh, good ideas like this, make them better, and to implement them. With that, let me just yield to the Senator of the White House again for just a, a big uh, thank you for the great work that you and Senator Coons and Senator Kyle and others are doing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank the uh, Senator from Rhode Island. I thank the Senator from Delaware. He uh, will, will this will the of course, from right, the Chairman. To make sure that I, I read it right, I just uh, I thank my friend from Rhode Island. I just wanted to interrupt briefly uh, to offer this uh, unanimous consent, M uh, Madam President. I have eight unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. Uh, they've been approved by the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and printed in the record. Without objection. Thank, with thanks to my friend, and I yield the floor back. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak, if I may, in the nature of a colloquy with the chairman and with uh, the senator from Delaware. And first, let me thank him for his very kind remarks. Senator Carper, I think, as everybody knows, in the Senate is really a bellwether of bipartisanship and constantly seeks cooperation. And um, I appreciate very much his efforts to bring us together here. Uh, the situation that I believe we're in, Mr. Chairman, you've been working very hard on these bills for uh, many years. The bill that is on the floor now is the product of considerable work in your committee, Homeland Security Committee, considerable work in the Intelligence Committee, uh, and considerable work in the uh, Commerce Committee primarily, although we in Judiciary um, have had some input as well. And so while there has been no specific hearing on the assembled bill, because it covers so many committees, it has to be brought together at some point, and its components have had extensive committee work. So we've all put a lot of effort into this, and we've actually all come a very, very long way, I believe. So our window is very short. And I hope and expect that we can put the hours ahead of us, literally, to work to try to close this gap. Um, but I believe that the distance that we have come, and particularly that last bit of distance that we came when you changed uh, S3414 to go from a traditional mandatory regulatory system to the new voluntary standard setting approach, um, really has moved us an enormous, enormous way. And now we're almost on the one yard line. And it would be such a shame, I believe, with things being that close if we couldn't close the deal. And I'd like to ask you to react to that assessment of our situation. And I'd also like to ask you to react to one other point, which is that the House took action on cybersecurity, but it only did so in the form of legislation on information sharing. All of our information, the letter yesterday from General Alexander, everything that we have heard from our national security officials is that that's not enough. You have two really important jobs. One is information sharing, and the other is defending America's privately owned critical infrastructure, our electric grids, our communications networks, our financial data processing systems. Those are our great liability. Those are the things that uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta was referring to when he said the next Pearl Harbor we confront could very well be a cyber attack. So are we as close as I think? And is it important that the Senate do its job because the House simply failed to address the critical infrastructure part of our responsibilities? Um, I, again, I thank uh, my friend from uh, Rhode Island. I thank him for the extraordinarily uh, constructive role he's played, an unusual here, unfortunately, uh, in bringing the group of, of eight members, four to he together with Senator Kyle of Arizona, four Democrats, four Republicans, who created a bridge that really 
invited uh, Senators Collins, Feinstein, Rockefeller, Carper, and I to come halfway across uh, to uh, change our bill from mandatory to voluntary. So my answers, uh, however, to your two questions are yes and yes. We are a lot closer um, than we were really just uh, a month ago, a matter of weeks ago. There, there is a remaining difference, and it's real, but, but uh, considering where we've come, if we're all, if we show a willingness to compromise, and again, as I've said over and over, not a compromise of principle, but a compromise that acknowledges that if everybody in the Senate insists on getting 100% of what they want on a bill, nobody's going to get 1% of what they want on a bill because nothing's going to pass. We've come back from our 100% quite a lot, and we hope that we can, and we're still open to ideas uh, that it will enable us to achieve what we need to achieve here in improving our cybersecurity, which means changing where we are now. That's why, as my friend from Rhode Island knows, we're going to keep meeting today with the leading sponsors of the other bill and with the peacemakers in between to uh, try to see if we can find uh, common ground and avoid, uh, uh, I think, what will be a, a very, dis could be a very disappointing cloture vote, very divisive, very destructive cloture vote. Uh, tomorrow. Second point is very important one that the House has acted, but it's only acted with regard to information sharing. This is this is important, but it's only half the job. The information sharing, in brief, says that private companies that operate critical infrastructure can share with other pr private companies if they're attacked. Uh, or, or as they begin to defend themselves, so they mutually can strengthen each other. Um, they can also share with the government. And the government, particularly through the Department of Homeland Security, National Security Agency, can help the private sector strengthen itself. Those kinds of communications, which are critical and would seem natural, don't happen now in, in too many cases because the private sector is anxious about liability it might incur. And even the public sector is limited in how much it can reach out and help. So that's important uh, uh, that the House has addressed that part of it. I will say, and not just parenthetically, that there has been very significant concern among a lot of Americans and, and a quite a remarkable coalition of uh, groups, remarkable in the sense that it's right to left along the ideological spectrum all concerned about the personal privacy rights of the American people, that they not be compromised as a result of this information sharing. Those, those advocacy, privacy advocacy groups are very, are, are not, not happy with the House information sharing bill. I'm pleased that they have uh, praised uh, what we've tried to do as a result of negotiations with colleagues in, the, in this chamber that are concerned about secure, or about uh, privacy. But the point you make, uh, Senator Whitehouse, is so true that it, that's only half the job. And uh, everybody who cares about cybersecurity has said it. Um, there was a, a really, um, I must say, <laughs> encouraging, inspiring for us editorial in the New York Times today supporting essentially the S3414, the underlying bill, uh, and, and really crying out to us to take action and not get dragged down into gridlock by special interest thinking. But here, here's the statistic that really jumped out at me. I saw it once before, but, I, but we haven't heard it in this debate. In the Times editorial today titled Cybersecurity at Risk, it, this sentence, last year a survey of more than 9,000 business executives in more than 130 countries by the PricewaterhouseCoopers consulting firm found that only 13% of those polled had taken adequate defensive action against cyber threats. Now that's worldwide, but I can tell you from what I know, the number in our country is not much better. And that's why we need this set of standards, best practices, um, computer hygiene, no longer mandatory, but I think once we, but we create an incentive, <clears throat> and it is if a company <clears throat> chooses to go into what my friend from Rhode Island, I think, has quite vividly uh, described as fort cybersecurity, 
We're going to build Fort Cybersecurity of the best practices to defend critical infrastructure, and we're going to leave it to the companies that operate critical infrastructure to decide totally on their own whether they want to go into Fort Cybersecurity. If they do, they will have um, some significant immunity from liability in the case of a major attack. So my answer to your questions are yes and yes. I just want to come back to something you said uh, at the outset of your remarks, because there is, I never know how much this argument uh, weighs on senators' minds, but once again it's being made here, which is this bill has received no hearings. It's, <clears throat> it's not ready for action. Good God. I attended, I went back and looked at the record. I attended my first hearing on cybersecurity held in what was then the Governmental Affairs Committee, it's now the Homeland Security Governmental Affairs Committee, chaired then by Senator Fred Thompson um, in 1998, 14 years ago. I can tell you that in recent years, uh, Senator Collins and I have held 10 hearings on the subject of cybersecurity. That's only in our committee. That's not counting judiciary, intelligence, commerce. I think foreign relations may have held a, uh, some hearings on it too. In fact, uh, we held a hearing just earlier this year, I believe it was March, on, on cybersecurity and the legislation that we knew we were going to bring uh, forward. So this has been heard. And I, I want to say this too. I mentioned Senator Reed's commitment to doing something about cybersecurity. <clears throat> Last year, and what I, I haven't, I'm trying to think, but I, I can't remember a time on another bill where I saw this happen. Senator Reed asked the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, to join him in calling in the Democratic chairs and the ranking Republican members of all of the relevant committees to cybersecurity that we've just talked about, and made an appeal that we work together uh, to, to bring one bill, which he would then, as he's done before, when, there, when a subject covers more than one committee, blend into a single bill and bring to the floor under the majority leader's authority pursuant to Rule 14 of the Senate rules, which he's done today. So there hasn't been a specific hearing on this bill, but Lord knows, there have been a lot of hearings, and this bill has been <laughs> vetted and negotiated not only with mem many members of the Senate, but by our committee and all the other committees, by stakeholders, private stakeholders, by some of the very businesses and business organizations that now seem to be um, the main block to moving forward on the bill. So um, I've probably responded to my friend at greater length but his, uh, than uh, I, I might have or perhaps than he expected. But, your questions were right on target, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Another question? Yes, sure. Um, you mentioned that it was important, to use your words, to help the private sector strengthen itself. And some of the debate that has surrounded this bill has suggested that if we just get the heavy hand of government out of the way, and let the nimble private sector do its thing to protect critical infrastructure, all will be well. And that a purely private sector way of proceeding is really the best way to proceed. In that context, you mentioned the study that showed that only 13% of the private businesses that were reviewed were adequately cybersecurity prepared. The NCIJTF, which is the FBI-led joint task force that protects our national uh, cyber infrastructure, has said that when they detect a cyber attack and they go out to work with the corporation that has been attacked, nine out of ten times, the corporation had no idea. And it's not just a government agency, the NC NCIJTF, saying that uh, there's a company called Mandiant that is sort of, who are you going to call Ghostbusters when you're hit? They come running in and they help companies do the cleanup. They've said the same thing. Nine out of ten times, these companies had to find out that they'd been penetrated from a government agency telling them, by the way, you've been hacked. They're in there. In fact, he said 48 out of the last 50 companies they dealt with had had no idea. The Aurora virus hit 300 American companies, only three of them knew it. 
And the Chamber of Commerce, which is very active in this debate, had Chinese hackers with complete impunity throughout its cyber systems without knowing about it for at least six months. And it was only when the government said, by the way, guys, your info is on a server in China, that they realized, oh my gosh, we've been hacked too. And then you've used the statistic that I've used before that uh, General Alexander, who's the head of Cyber Command, has adopted, which is that America is now on the losing end of the biggest transfer of wealth in history through illicit means as a result of the cyber industrial espionage stealing from us our chemical formulas, our manufacturing processes, and various things that create value here in the, in the country. So I'm not just pinpointing individual examples. If you look at it from a macro point of view, we're getting our clocks cleaned in this area, and the private sector, it seems to me, all of the evidence suggests this is just an area in which it is not adequately protecting itself without a government role to spur cooperation and to set an agreed standard that NSA and the people who are watching this with real anxiety every day know is an adequate standard to meet the needs. And uh, if you would respond to that, I'd be grateful. Well, uh, basically I'd say I agree, uh, Senator Whitehouse. There's not uh, much I can add to that. Th th this is not uh, legislation that is, is a solution in search of a problem. Th this is a real problem. And uh, again, we're hearing it from all the cybersecurity experts. And, and uh, if um, the, the private sector owners of critical cyber infrastructure, electric power grid, telecommunications, finance, water dams, et cetera, telecommunications, uh, if they were taking enough defensive action, we, we wouldn't want to act. But they're not. And we, and we understand why. Uh, as you know, we've talked about this. A lot of the CIOs, the chief information officers in, um, in the companies uh, get frustrated that their CEOs don't want to devote enough um, time and resources to beefing up their cyber defenses. You, you said something really important, which is th th cyber theft and cyber attack is so insidious that a lot of people who are victims of cyber attack companies don't even know it. And, you know, my great fear is that there's a lot of malware or bugs or whatever, I called it earlier, a kind of cyber cell planted in some of our critical cyber control systems in our country, um, waiting for the moment when an enemy wants to attack us. Senator Reid yesterday, uh, because people have a hard time imagining this, pointed to this terrible tragedy in India where the power system has gone out. There's no evidence that this is a cyber attack. But I saw today 600 million people are without electricity. And it's had a terrible effect on the quality of life and the economy, et cetera. Unfortunately, th this is what today an enemy um, who, who's uh, capable, and they're out there, could do to us. So I thank my friend. I'd be glad to yield yeah, to I wanna... the Senator from Maryland. But the conclusion is that it would be prudent to, v the only reasonable conclusion one could draw is that it would be prudent to view with some caution and some skepticism the claims of folks who are hacked and penetrated at will and who often don't, usually don't even know it, that don't worry, trust us, we can take care of this, everything is fine. And uh, I, I thank my friend, and of course I agree, and that's why we're, um, we're legislating, but we're trying to legislate as minimally as we possibly can to begin to solve this problem. So I would yield the floor. Um, senator from Maryland is here, and the senator from North Dakota is here. Does the senator from North Dakota? Uh, okay. I think he should. Okay, I would yield. I, I'd uh, like yep. to thank the good senator from uh, Connecticut. I'm here to speak, uh, but uh, certainly want to accommodate schedules. No, no, we would, uh, uh, in the order of the, of the Senate, in fairness, <laughs> we would yield uh, to my friend from North Dakota. Senator from North Dakota. Madam President, I rise to speak as if in morning business uh, on the subject of energy rather than cyber. I, I want to uh, 
commend my colleagues for their excellent work on cyber, and I look forward to working with them. And I thank them for the incredible amount of work and diligence they're putting into this extremely important effort. Um, I'm, I rise this morning to uh, speak on, on the incredible importance of energy security for our country. Uh, last week, I introduced the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act, uh, along with 30 sponsors on the legislation. It's a comprehensive plan for energy security for our country. When I say energy security, what I mean is producing more energy than we consume, getting our nation to energy security by actually uh, not only producing enough energy for our needs, but, but even beyond that. And it's absolutely doable. There's no question we can do it. Uh, it's about pursuing an all-of-the-above strategy. And I mean truly pursuing an all-of-the-above strategy, not saying it and then picking certain types of energy we want and don't want, but instead creating a, a climate and a, a national comprehensive energy policy that, that truly empowers private investment to develop all of our energy resources and all types of energy. Now, the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act is actually a package of energy bills. Many of these have already passed the House, and we've introduced them now in the Senate as well. Uh, Thirteen separate pieces of legislation pulled together into this energy package with energy leaders from both the House uh, and the Senate. And it clearly demonstrates that we have a strategy, we have a comprehensive energy plan to move our country and that it's ready to go. If you look at the situation right now, there are hundreds of billions of dollars of private investment, of capital that would be invested in energy projects in this country, but they're being held up. They're being held on the sidelines, these projects, because of inability to be permitted or because of a burdensome regulation. We need to create the kind of approach, the kind of business climate, the kind of energy policy that will unleash that private investment. And that's exactly what this legislation does. First, it reduces the regulatory burden. Reduces the regulatory burden so these stalled energy projects, and again, hundreds of billions of dollars in private investment, not government spending, in private investment that would move forward with energy projects that would not only develop more energy, more cost effectively, more dependably, but also with better environmental stewardship, with the latest, greatest technology, deploying the latest, greatest technology that would produce the energy and do it with better environmental stewardship, not only for this country, but actually leading the world to more energy production with better environmental stewardship. But these projects are held up either because they can't get permitted or because they can't get through the regulatory red tape to get started and get going. This legislation cuts through that. It also helps us develop the vital infrastructure we need for energy development. Great example, Keystone XL pipeline, a 7 billion, 1700 mile pipeline that would move oil from Canada to our refineries in the United States, but that would also move oil from my home state, 100,000 barrels a day for starters, to refineries. We need that vital infrastructure. That's just one example. This legislation also develop our res develops our resources on public lands as well as private lands. So we're talking about expedited permitting, both onshore and offshore, on private lands and on public lands, including for renewables. It, it sets realistic goals. It sets a market-based approach that will truly foster all of our energy resources rather than picking winners and losers. It would also put a freeze and require a study of rules that are driving up gasoline prices that are hitting families and businesses across this country. And it includes uh, legislation that Senator Murkowski of Alaska has, has added to our package that would require uh, an inventory of critical minerals in the United States and set policies to develop them as a key part of developing a comprehensive energy approach, a comprehensive energy plan for our country. So what's the impact? But what is the impact? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce in March of last year put forward a report. In that report, they showed that there are more than 350 energy projects nationwide that are being held up, either due to inability to get permitted or regulatory burden, as I've described, more than 350 projects that if we could just greenlight these projects would generate $1.1 trillion 
in gross domestic product and create 1.9 million jobs a year just in the construction phase. So this legislation truly is about energy, more energy, better technology, better environmental stewardship, but it's also very much about creating jobs, creating jobs at a time when we have more than 8.2 percent unemployment, more than 13 million people out of work looking for work. This will create an incredible number of jobs. It is about creating economic growth. You look at our debt and our deficit, our debt now approaching 16 trillion dollars. We need to get this economy going and growing to reduce that deficit and reduce that debt along with controlling our spending, but we need economic growth to get on top of that debt and deficit. As I described, just the 350 projects alone, I mentioned 1.1 trillion in GDP to help create that economic growth, to put people to work and help reduce our deficit and our debt. And let's talk about national security. The reality is with the kind of approach that I'm putting forward here in the United States and working together with our closest friend and ally, Canada, we can get to energy security without a doubt in five to seven years. That means producing more energy than we consume within five to seven years. Think how important that is. Look what's going on in the Middle East. Look what's going on in Syria. What's going to happen there? Look at what's going on in Iran, their efforts to pursue a nuclear weapon and what's going to happen with the Strait of Hormuz, an incredible amount of oil that goes through that area. Look what's happening in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. Do we really want to be dependent on the Middle East for our oil? I think the American people have said very clearly no, and we don't have to be. We do not have to be. We just need the right approach to make it happen right here and to work with our closest friend and ally, Canada. The reality is developing our energy resources is an incredible opportunity and we need to seize it right now with both hands. We can do it. That is exactly the plan we are putting forward. Earlier this year, we passed legislation through the House and here through the Senate. It was in conjunction with the payroll tax uh, credit legislation. Attached to it, we uh, required that the president make a decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. He chose to turn it down. Shortly after that, the Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, went to China. He met with Chairman Hu and the Chinese leaders, their energy leaders, and he signed a memorandum of agreement. That memorandum of agreement between China and Canada called for more economic cooperation and more energy development, Chinese working in conjunction with Canada. Just last week, CNUC, one of the largest Chinese companies, government-controlled company, made a $15 billion tender offer for the Nexon Oil Company, a large oil company in Canada, $15 billion to purchase their interests in the Canadian oil sands also includes uh, mineral interests offshore, lease interests offshore uh, of the United States in, in the Gulf region, as well as uh, in the North Sea area. But primarily, it, it is an acquisition by the Chinese of huge amounts of tracks in the, in the oil sands in Canada. So here we go, just what we said. If we don't work with Canada on projects like the Keystone XL pipeline, the oil that's produced in Canada, instead of coming to the United States, will go to China. Or Americans will be put in the position of buying Canadian oil from the Chinese because of a failure to act on key things like the Keystone XL pipeline, because we're not acting on the kind of energy policy we're putting forward right here. Ask the American people what they want, what they want is that we move forward with the energy package that we put forward. And we need to do it. If you check gas prices, they're now back up to $3.50 a gallon national average. When the current administration took, took office, they were $1.85 national average per gallon. That's a 90% increase. What ramifications does that have for our economy? What ramifications does that have for uh, small businesses? What ramifications does that have for American 
families, hardworking American families? I think we all know the answer to that. The time to move forward is now. It, it couldn't be more clear. We control our own destiny. We need to take action. We need to move forward on the kind of energy plan that truly benefits our people and our country. I call on my colleagues to join me in this effort. And I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Maryland. Madam President, I come to the floor today to talk about cyber 